Good morning. Let me begin by thanking the organizers and all of the people at the Fee Center whose labor has made this conference possible. It's a great privilege to be addressing a conference in Quebec and in Canada, where for, so, uh, for years so much important interactive and participatory work has been made. The world is littered with the remains of unpreserved works. And archives are full of works that are preserved poorly, preserved only in part, preserved without context, preserved without nuance or flavor. Could we save interactive digital documentaries from what seems to be this inevitable destiny of difficult media? I want to know, um, I want to ask how many people are coming into this conference tending optimistic versus pessimistic? How many optimists are there here? Oh, half maybe? And pessimists? At least you admit it. Okay. Um, who am I? I feel as if I've walked into a luncheonette populated by diners who've been eating there for years. What, what I do, though, is make participatory films during which the audience talks while the film is rolling. These are different every time they screen. They're effectively unpreservable. For years, I've also collected difficult cinema. And now I collect home movies, the works that confound archivists because they're so hard to preserve, to catalog, to contextualize. But I am not a technical preservationist. We're here to expand our understanding of preservation, but I'm also going to suggest that we need to expand our sense of what archives are and what archives could be. This is because new works don't always fit into old repositories. New works don't always fit into old archives. And archives, of course, aren't always the prime motivators of preservation. So I'm here to provoke, to suggest a few different and sometimes contradictory ways to think about preservation, not just preservation, but also archives. Because I've come to realize, working as an archivist and as a writer and as a maker, that some of the answers to the riddles of preservation um, may lie in rethinking, in re-engineering, in monkey wrenching the places where preservation happens. So today there will be no doubt talk about developing common practices, coming to common understandings of what and how to preserve. This is both essential and it's wise, but is that all we need to do? Those of us who make uh, iDocs, which I'm going to use as a container for everything today, <laughs> those of us who make iDocs hope to break new ground with each film that we make or with each practice that we introduce. We want to fuse uh, traditional understandings of narrativity with those yet to be discovered. We resist formulaic traps. This tells me that while we are keen to find archival solutions, that we should certainly also resist archival formulas. So I've clustered my thoughts under three umbrellas, which you will see in closure, provocation, and post-archives. In the city where I live, San Francisco, artists are deeply fascinated with glitch, with breaks in the transmi transmission chain, with flawed renderings, with mutilated picture, and distorted sound, with ghosts in the machine, make it look ugly. Glitch replays a 20th century litany. Mimesis is futile. Beauty resides in its own destruction. Violence is inherent in the birth and in the movement of images. But to me, you know, glitch art fails to get one thing about itself, that all media art is glitch art. It doesn't last. Obsolescence and extinction are the default digital conditions, to paraphrase something Howard Besser said long, long time ago. Preservation is the greatest aberration. Preservation is the greatest glitch of all. Works are enclosed by their ephemerality. And digitality is funny. Somebody pranked this at Internet Archive. I didn't do this. Um, digitality is funny because while it introduces many new affordances, it shares many characteristics with older media forms. And one of the most striking characteristics of moving image works, both old and new, is that most of them, except for the few that are in long-term distribution, tend to suffer from enclosure. They find their way into archives, and most don't find their way out again. Archival enclosure literally means that the record is sequestered from viewing and from use. It could be enclosed by copyright, because it's unpreserved and delicate, by inaccessibility, lack of cataloging, or by archivists who are unwilling to assume even slight risks. But another kind of enclosure applies to interactive works. You can put them in solitary confinement. You can protect them from touch and use. You can keep them from interaction. This ages the works prematurely. 
This prevents them from adapting or being adapted to new users and uses and to new platforms and code. I don't think you can keep, keep uh, interactive works alive when they're sequestered in a sandbox. You do not need law, restrictions, or locks to enclose a work. You just have to make it inconvenient to touch, inconvenient to use. And that's often a characteristic of an aging interactive work. Its affordances are like temporary abilities that over time evolve into disabilities. There's different modalities of accessing different material enclosed by aging frameworks. One, of course, has been to just take a picture of it. This is what art books do. And, you know, even if they don't, if they fall short of reaching artists' intentions, they have a purpose. Google Books took pictures of millions of books. And in fact, taking pictures of objects is quite often the way that we understand digitizing today, which has evolved from slow scanning to more rapid photography to 3D scanning to LiDAR. Think of the Google Street View and the Uber. The Uber car is topped with rapidly rotating panoptic eyes and now, now scanning non-visible spectra or looking into solid objects. Uh, we're getting better at representing a certain exactitude, and each new kind of capture convinces us that it is what digitation, digitization should be, convinces us that it is corralling in some elusive truth of objects and events. But all by itself, the moving image archival community is not going to build the tech infrastructure for digital preservation. The problems are spread across too many domains. Even the studios are trapped in imperfect solutions. Preservation is like borrowing at a variable interest rate. There's no certainty. And the technical issues won't be the hardest to solve. The cultural and curatorial issues are much harder. Because on a broader level, co-creation resists enclosure. It is by ver its very nature unruly. It resists being crammed into archival containers. As I'll get into shortly, it also may be sensitive. It is increasingly distributed across platforms and services. As makers, we may choose to serve our viewers by tactical collaborations with archival unfriendly services. This issue may be harder and harder to solve. So we're going to likely hear today about good stuff, emulation, browser-based, platform agnostic playback, robust and sustainable containers for interactive assets, preserving tech infrastructure and documentation, policy and sustainability, a lot of good ideas. But I want to jump up a few levels and ask some even more basic questions. So a parallel. Um, I've collected many kinds of things. These days, it's home movies and amateur film. And one thing that's very clear is that we cannot really represent these materials with an eye towards recreating the conditions or the situation under which they were originally seen. They're gone. The living room home movie evening is distorted by memory and nostalgia. We may drink in the hyper-reality of Kodachrome, but the trains and the cars and the families are lost in a barely examined past. The tech infrastructure is gone. This is a prefiguration of what's happening with iDocs. The, the preservation of the work falls far short of preserving the experience. But I want to say loss can be formative. The histories that we investigate most eagerly today, and this is, um, uh, William hinted at this, the histories that we investigate most eagerly today are often histories of losses that we want to remediate, erasures that we hope to repair. The crime of erasure and the experience of loss can powerfully stimulate the work of artists and historians. While we should never make peace with erasure, we might get better at coming to terms with the inevitability of digital loss. This might not mean welcoming it, but it could mean accepting its inevitability. As I say, I make participatory films for audiences who talk while they're playing. Each screening mixes a mostly silent movie with hundreds, maybe thousands, of spontaneous comments and conversations in the room. People always say, why don't you record the audience talking? And I say, well, you know, it's very hard, but I don't want to, because each event belongs to that audience. The soundtrack is theirs. It's their definition of what the film is for theirs. It's not to be repeated. It's not a canonical event. People come to be part of a unique event that owes little to anyone else. And so these works can never be preserved in full. But in, a, in another way, the biggest difficulty is preserving the record of interactivity itself. When authorship is shared between makers and audiences, 
we should say, navigators. It's hard to imagine just preserving one vector of a multi-directional work because we're producing works that are made to be navigated by particular individuals at a particular stage of human development. Humans are not static. Preserving the particularity of the interactive experience might suggest that we preserve audiences at the same time that we preserve IDOCs. <laughs> well, so this is hard. Um, but we might at least record and preserve their behavior. Um, thinking about aggregate usage data, records of beaten paths, but maybe also individual usage trails in the sense that they constitute alternative narratives. But this... Uh, this is hard, um, complicated territory. Media preservation starts to bleed over into the preservation of personal records. Huge can of worms. Archivists that are working with uh, personal digital archives are working with complex records that could potentially hurt their creators and custodians. We've seen this in the Black Lives Matter movement. Should they be saved by community archives or less culturally sensitive repositories? What about official retribution. You may think this is far-fetched, but imagine an IDOC about, let's say, consent or microaggressions, where the facets include collecting, comparing, linking, selectively replaying individual experiences. Not only protecting the identities might be important, but the substances of the experience as well. Or imagine VR worlds where extremely personal narratives are generated, like the one in New York now where you hug your mother and, God, I don't know what's going to happen from that. Um, the uh, the Mukatu scheme is a way of labeling content that's not intended to be universally accessible, traditional cultural knowledge. Um, the anthropologist Mary Morell has suggested that the um, concerns that we see in indigenous and aboriginal communities in some cases about disseminating uh, expressions that are not meant to be shared may migrate outward from culturally disenfranchised populations to society as a whole. This could overturn the internet. Um, but right now we're used to giving up our privacy when we touch a screen. I bring this up because I think we're going to start seeing narrative and game platforms turn into primary social and navigational interfaces for people. So in a sense, the iDoc, which right now plays to a, a perhaps a smaller audience, may be a precursor of something that's much more universal. But I've hardly begun to provoke. So what if we step away from the thought of preservation? What if it was commonly understood that memory of an event could be equally as valuable as reconstructing the event itself? Borrowing the terms used by Boleslav Matuszewski, who may have been the first person in the 1890s to suggest moving image archives, what if we opted for anecdote rather than exactitude? Because our brains practice a kind of compression, we might even say curation, not literal continuities. They select and they abstract textures and patterns and sensation. Could we flush the detail? and recall interactivity in similar ways, an edited picture of usage patterns, events triggered by an IDOC. Could we look at the mechanisms of human memory as a template for another kind of archives? Or, and I have to say this, by the way, read this story. This is an amazing story. Every archivist should read this story. Should we instead fight the assumption of longevity that we hold sort of quixotically for our creations? Could we propose a kind of radical expendability? Could we emphasize non-repeatability in tense but limited runs? Could IDOCs build timeouts into their long-term histories? Could we turn the fields over every few years? Or might we turn 180 and insist that IDOCs be kept alive, be maintained on perpetual life support, that no interactive or participatory work become like the passenger pigeon? Um, just as we keep a conventional movie alive, should we keep IDOCs alive? That would mean eternal debugging. It would mean continual navigation, post-archives. So new works, as I said, don't always fit into old archives. And old archives are part of an ecosystem that often hangs on past failures rather than future possibilities. Jared Drake, uh, one of a number of black activist archivists, says the traditional way of doing archives is beyond salvage. He compares old school archives to the Quaker-built Eastern State Penitentiary. He says, 
silence, solitude, and surveillance. He, he describes these terms in, uh, in terms of the limits that they impose on physical archives, but in online space, silence might use gagged users who can't remix or interact. Solitude might mean no sharing, no redistribution, no collective experience. Surveillance, obviously observation of habits and trails. These are carceral archives where ritualistic practices fence off holdings from users and the historical record from the public. We're making digital archives like this today, and we shouldn't. Whose archives? Anyone can buy hard drives. And even if they're not doing it perfectly, lots of people are practicing vernacular digital preservation. This is a feature, not a flaw, because many iDocs are horizontalist productions, or they're built in a, in a horizontal matter rather than top-down structure we're familiar with from traditional production. And many emerging archives, I think, will follow a similar model. We're going to see archives models splinter into kind of a kaleidoscope of possibilities. Um, we might acknowledge that archives aren't just clean, sparse spaces with deep stacks or classical buildings with columns. Um, but we also speak of the archive in the loosest way imaginable. For filmmakers, our archive is our closet, or maybe our account at Iron Mountain. For artists, our archive is the name for just about anything, papers, things, ideas, feelings, assembled. The word archive is also striking for its peculiar absence of archival labor. But all of these fall short of what we need now. We need actionable repositories that are labs, that are as innovative as the production arrangements that we set up. We can't know what this means. Jarrett Drake says, archives are not things so much as they are processes. And scholar Michelle Caswell says, community-based archival work is an ongoing process of conceptualizing what we want the future to look like. What we want the future to look like. We need to make preservation goal-driven. Digital librarian Bethany Novisky says, um, we are building our digital libraries to be received by audiences as lenses for retrospect rather than as stages to be leapt upon by performers, by co-creators. They're not the improv platforms that they should be. Archives should be spaces for projection, planning, performance, speculation. I don't want special collections anymore. I want speculative ones. Um, how can we design digital libraries that admit, this is Bethany Novisky, I wish it were me. How can we design digital libraries that admit alternate futures, that recognize that people uh, require the freedom to construct their own independent philosophical infrastructure to escape time's arrow and subvert, if they wish, the unidirectional and neoliberal te temporal constructs that have so often been tools of injustice? It sounds a lot like the the documentaries we'd be making or like to make. Um, I'll, these slides will be online. Investigate some of these projects, Afrofuturism, Arc of Aliveness, Generous Interfaces. These, some of these are embryonic, some are established. Some of them may be our future. So let me wind up with this excellent diagram. This is the permaculture diagram developed by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren in Tasmania. It's an astonishing parallel uh, to um, archiving and preservation. You can <coughs> look at it yourself, but you know, design from pattern to detail. These are the, the, the fonds, the archival fonds. I especially like use edges, value the marginal. Important things happen at the intersections of community. Important things happen when there's cross-fertilization, catch and store energy, use and value renewables. These are all archival maxims. This is a great way to think about production as well. Permaculture encourages using the outputs of one system as the inputs to another, a perfect paradigm for archival work. It's comparable to rejecting the cycle of media making that goes produce, exploit, forget. Helps us think about integrating archival concerns into production and post-production to modulate authorship and production with archival activity, because both authorship and archival activity are creative acts. Both need to be recognized as necessary labor. We can't always throw the, the uh, burden of preservation onto third parties. We can't keep creating problems for archivists to fix ex post facto. We could bring them in, 
to help us take some precautions, perhaps. So I know many of these thoughts seem contradictory, but I do hope that we can come to terms with an expansive range of preservation practices and a spectrum of archival activity that is as broad as the works that archives contain. Uh, because if archives are to ride the oncoming waves, it will not be as arcs fully caulked to repel leaks, but as permeable wetlands, capable of assimilating ebbs and flows, venues where past and present and future interchange and transform uh, one another. Thank you.